Thank you, Doug. And um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, as Doug mentioned, we're gonna talk all about Nutria today. Um, specifically, I wanna provide you with information about invasive Nutria and their impacts and why this is such a significant issue in California um, and, and really what we're doing about it. We may have a little bit of a lag here. There we go. Okay, so I'm sure that we have several biologists and ecologists joining us today, but our hope is also that we're reaching the general public and, and getting this information out there um, broader than our scientific community. So I wanna go ahead and start with, um, just by defining invasive species. So what are invasive species? Um, the definition, um, the federal definition, is that um, invasive species are a, a species that is not native to the ecosystem and also whose introduction causes or is likely to cause harm to the environment, the economy, or to human health. Um, agriculture, um, specifically in California, is really um, also a consideration of those impacts, which is um, typically lumped in with environmental and economic harm. Um, to that, I, I also want to add that typically um, invasive species are also prolific reproducers. So that is something we're going to see a pretty good example of today as well. So nutria are large semi-aquatic rodents. They reach up to about 20 pounds in size and inhabit both fresh and brackish water systems. Um, specifically, we see them in ponds and sloughs, river backwaters canals, um, you know, low to slow and no flow waters. Um, they're native to South America. They were introduced to North America, specifically first to California in the early 1900s. Um, they were farmed in California through the 30s and the 40s. Um, once that fur market collapsed, we saw a lot of animals were released um, and those in addition to animals that had previously escaped had established feral populations in California um, that were present through the 60s. And ultimately those populations were eradicated in the 1970s. Now I wanna go ahead and start right off the bat by just stressing to you all how similar nutria are in appearance to our native aquatic mammals, um, specifically muskrats and beavers. Um, they can also be confused with otters, but um, primarily there's a, a great deal of overlap between nutria um, and muskrats and beavers. So the photo on the bottom left of your screen from left to right is a muskrat, a juvenile nutria, an adult nutria, and then a beaver. So you can see, you know, there's a great deal of overlap between an adult muskrat and a juvenile nutria, as well as an adult nutria and, and smaller beavers. Um, Valerie, nutria are, yes. Hi, I just wanted to mention that um, if you, uh, you can use your cursor as a pointer. Oh, perfect. Do you guys see that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good deal. Thank you. Um, so this flyer that you see on your screen is a resource that we put together um, to aid in identification of nutria. Um, but what I want to stress here is, is the distinguishing characteristics um, of nutria, which include that long round tail, um, which is in contrast to the, the beaver's paddle-like tail, and the, the muskrat's sort of triangular wedge-shaped tail. Um, they're long white whiskers, so we see um, often white muzzles on muskrats and occasionally beaver, but it's those long white whiskers that are the distinguishing characteristics for nutria. And then um, the tracks on the, the front and the hind feet, so they have four toes in the front in contrast to beaver with five, and then five toes on the hind feet, which are only partially webbed, which was also unique. Um, but as you can see, you know, when these animals are in the water, they're, they're very hard to distinguish from one another. But the photo on the top left of the screen, um, you can see a bit of that golden fur underneath the ear, which is proving to be a pretty reliable um, distinguishing characteristic for us here in California. So, Moving forward, um, nutria are rodents. They reproduce early and often. These animals become reproductive by roughly four to six months of age. Average litter size is six. Um, the, the literature actually says five to six. We're actually topping six here in California. 
Um, but these animals can, can produce three litters in 13 months, um, which is pretty rapid reproduction. Um, they live in social groups that typically consist of a dominant male, several reproducing females, and their juveniles. Um, and these animals turn around and, and they put a litter on the ground and they can breed back within 48 hours. So their, their reproduction is, is very rapid. Um, these social groups or colonies typically have a home range size of less than 25 acres. But as those juveniles start to mature, they're driven out of the group and disperse as far as 50 miles away. So they are very capable of, of expanding both their population size and their geographic distribution very rapidly. Um, nutria are destructive herbivores. Um, each animal can consume up to 25% of their body weight each day. So for a 20 pound animal, they might eat five pounds of vegetation in that day. Um, but they're, they're very destructive. They prefer the basal portions of emergent vegetation. And so while they might consume up to five pounds a day, um, they can destroy as much as 10 times of the amount that they consume while going for those preferred portions of the food plants. So if they're eating five pounds a day, they might be wasting 50 pounds a day. And if we start talking about a social group or a colony in one area, you know, a dozen animals or so, um, and actually in, in our most dense location, we've worked a 10 acre pond that has had 86 nutria removed from it. So we start thinking about the compounding impacts of all of that feeding damage and all of the, the destruction of the vegetation we ultimately end up seeing really severe erosion, loss of wetland soils, um, and ultimately conversion to open water, which you're going to see some examples of shortly. Some other really significant threats in California is um, the damage caused by nutria burrowing activity. So again, these animals live in social groups. Um, they're not like beavers. They don't build lodges they burrow and they create multi-level dens that can extend as far as 18 feet deep and may extend as far as 150 feet into the bank. So that's, those are really severe threats to California, California's infrastructure for water conveyance systems, um, water supplies, flood protection levees, um, as well as the erosion that is caused um, along our waterways, particularly our rivers that um, in this setting, our salmonids depend on um, those waterways for their reproduction and the erosion and increased sedimentation caused by these burrowing activities um, further impacts those species as well. So now I want to look a little bit at some of the more notorious um, infestations of nutria, particularly here in North America. Um, Louisiana is a similar story. Nutria were introduced in the 30s for the fur trade. By the 50s, they were documenting damages, um, not really doing anything for control. By the 90s, the damage was so extensive, um, they had documented that over 100,000 coastal acres had been damaged or completely lost. So they had lost a lot of their protection from the storm systems coming in on the coast. Um, so over 100,000 coastal acres damaged, that doesn't even include you know, any, any estimates of the quantity or area. Um, of inland acreages that were damaged. So at that time, they had estimated um, populations in the several millions. Um, they started evaluating whether or not there was anything that could be done and determined, you know, this, this population is, is too far gone. It can't be eradicated. Our only real option for control is an incentive program. So in the year 2002, Louisiana implemented um, a, a bounty program for Nutria to pay $5 a tail for up to 400,000 nutria every single year, just to maintain the population and try to um, minimize or reduce the, the environmental damage caused by nutria. So the images that you see on your screen um, on the left is, is a sort of a broader view of um, the impacts of nutria feeding and damage to marsh. So you see out in the middle is that exclosure um, that precludes nutria herbivory. And then the close up you can see when, when nutria are not able to feed and, and damage um, that soil organic matter, you know, that's the only thing that's really holding these wetland soils and that vegetation community together. 
Um, so since 2002, over 5 million nutria have been harvested um, at a cost of $24 million. Um, for the last 12 years, they have averaged about 350,000 nutria taken every year just to maintain the population. Now on the flip side of that is the Chesapeake Bay. So the Delmarva Peninsula, um, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia, where similarly nutria were introduced in the 40s. Um, they documented damages in the 50s, some really severe winters in the 70s, knocked the population back, but then it came back with a boom in the 80s. Similarly in the 90s, they start paying attention to um, all of the damage that's been caused the photo, um, this time series of 1939 and 1989. That is the Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge on Delmarva Peninsula. Um, in the 50 years following nutria introduction, they lost over 50% of their marsh habitat um, in that refuge. And a great deal of that was, was attributed to nutria herbivory and um, loss of those wetland soils. So in 2000, um, the, the Chesapeake Bay the Maryland team um, received some federal funding to evaluate the nutria situation and determine whether or not eradication was a possibility. Um, in 2002, they implemented um, the, the Chesapeake Bay Nutria Eradication Project. And since implementing that program in 2002, they have now removed um, 14,000 nutria They've not had a single detection in, I think, four years now. So they're getting very close to being able to successfully declare eradication in that area. So um, we're watching very closely what they have done, what lessons they've learned, and, and what we can um, learn from their experiences. The photos on the, the bottom of this slide are um, on the left is prior to nutria removal. And then on the right is um, recovery of that plant community and ecosystem following site eradication of nutria from that area. So I want to shift gears a little bit here and talk about um, talk about California and the potential here. So you know Louisiana and Chesapeake, there were some pretty um, stark differences in the populations that they dealt with there um, and the population size and the geographic area that they have to, um, to cover in order to manage those populations. But specifically here in California, I wanna talk a little bit about um, what the potential for this population looks like. Um, so we went through the literature um, gathering average values from invasive populations across the globe. And um, so using an average lifespan of three years, 50, uh, a, a ballpark estimate of the 50 initial um, animals in the source population at a one-to-one -one sex ratio, an average litter size of six and three litters every 13 months. This population has the potential to grow from 50 to roughly 240,000 animals in a five-year time frame. Um, so what I want you to take away from this is um, the very small window of opportunity that we have to effectively deal with this population and eradicate before the population size in the geographic area grows too large to be able to effectively um, deal with all these animals. What this population um, model did not include was a factor of, of estimated mortality in the population. And um, the reason why, I wanna talk a little bit about um, population control and why um, mortality, natural mortality, is um, not really a contributing factor here like it is in other locations. Um, in the native range, so nutria are native to Southern South America. In their native range, nutria are preyed upon by big cats, so jaguars and ocelots, as well as caiman, and they're hunted for food. In Louisiana, they have the very active um, bounty program, which removes, you know, three to 400,000 animals every year. They're preyed upon by um, comparable species, so alligator, um, as well as gar fishes and um, cottonmouths or water moccasins. Um, in the Chesapeake Bay, they have really severe winters that um, not only cause mortality in adults and juveniles, but also really inhibit reproduction in females. 
So that's, um, you know, these are factors we don't have working in our favor here in California. They've also had the very active trapping program and um, also report take by um, large predatory birds. Um, so both in the Pacific Northwest and in the Chesapeake Bay, they report take by um, eagles. However, in California, we, um, we don't have a lot of these factors working in our favor. We do have coyotes and mountain lions and bobcats, um, but you know, we don't believe that these populations will um, make a substantial contribution to mortality in this population in terms of population control. So again, um, I wanna tie this back to um, our small window of opportunity for eradication. So if you, if you picture, revisit, this population growth curve where we see sort of slow population growth over roughly the first two to three years, and then we get to exponential growth in the population um, from years four to five. And we look at how this relates to um, the invasion curve. So basically from the point of introduction, um, as a population has time to um, expand both in population size and the area infested, you start to see a rapid rate of increase in which, um, you know, shortly after introduction, we have a small window of opportunity where eradication um, is, is most efficient and effective and the greatest likelihood of success. Um, but once you get outside that window of opportunity and cross that threshold, your only options are really containing the population and then at some point trying to contain and reduce and mitigate the damages caused by those infestations. So I just want to reiterate here that in California, we are, we are in this window of opportunity for eradication and, um, and really want to stress the importance of being able to um, get this eradication completed within this time frame. So what's going on in California? Um, in March of 2017, a pregnant female nutria, um, pregnant with seven young, was located in a private managed wetland in Merced County um, within the Grasslands District. Um, at that point, we um, initiated additional surveys and some trapping efforts in the local area and um, from that point through March of the next year, we ended up taking um, roughly 30 nutria um, and also were able to confirm their presence in the five county area. So they had been confirmed in Stanislaus County, Merced County, Fresno, Mariposa County, and Tuolumne. So at that point in March of 2018, um, the department responded by instituting an incident command system, which effectively allowed us to redirect both staff and resources from throughout the department across the state. Um, that provided us with leadership and field crews to implement both surveys and trapping efforts, as well as to work on long-term planning um, to prepare for eradication. We also contracted with USDA Wildlife Services for um, five trappers that are also contributing to the workload in areas of infestation. And we're also working in partnership with the Department of Food and Agriculture. Um, so we have sort of two different approaches here going on. Um, the Department of Food and Agriculture is working on population delimitation surveys. So while CDFW and Wildlife Services are sort of working from the inside out, we're surveying to find the animals and we're trapping and responding from the inside out. Concurrently, the Department of Food and Agriculture is working to delimit the population. So they're working outside in. So we've got two different strategies that are working together here um, to be able to determine the full extent of this population, as well as locate all of these animals and respond to populations where they're detected. So in terms of what this looks like operationally, um, our, our first step in all of this is being able to obtain um, access from landowners. So the map that you see on this page, um, this is a representation of um, all of the areas where we have received permits to access private properties um, to go in and conduct our surveys and our trapping. So the red and the yellow that you see on this map, you can ignore the red, these are density dots for nutrient take. Um, the green and the yellow represent areas where we have permits to go in and do this work. 
Um, we are working a 40 acre grid across the landscape. So um, all of our operations are, are based on these 40 acre cells. Um, where we have access and their suitable habitat exists, um, we're going through a five phase eradication strategy that starts with surveys. So we've got to delimit the distribution of nutria and identify um, all of the locations where these animals are. Um, this operation functions on the premise that every animal must be located and um, put at risk. So the first step is surveying. Um, we're going in, we're classifying habitat suitability. We're looking for any potential sign or confirmed sign um, where nutria are confirmed. We transition into trapping. Um, where we see prime habitat or potential sign, we're deploying um, camera stations and monitoring platforms um, and baited stations to be able to um, increase the probability that we detect any nutria that are there. Where nutria are confirmed, we implement knockdown trapping. So this is um, systematic trapping to reduce the nutrient population to zero or near zero densities. So effectively we go in, we trap until we believe we have removed every single nutria from that cell. Um, at that point we have either removed them all or we have removed nearly all of them. So once the knockdown phase um, concludes we transition into mop up and so that is um, following knockdown, we go in and we implement early detection and rapid response. Um, so we're trying to detect any remnant or immigrating nutria that have come back into those previously trapped areas um, to quickly remove them and prevent any um, reinfestation of the area. Once knockdown and mop up have been completed in those areas, um, we transition into verification, which is repeated and ongoing application of detection methods. Um, so again, at this point, you know, we're, we're trying to confirm and ensure that all nutria have been removed from that site and continued failure to detect nutria or signs of their presence um, indicate that site eradication has been achieved. And then over the long term is the surveillance phase. So this is continual monitoring at a reduced intensity to ensure that eradication has been achieved and is maintained. So this is that long term um, monitoring that occurs after the last animal has been removed. Now at that point, for a great deal of time, we won't know um, with confidence that the last animal has been removed, but this is the um, surveillance phase that ultimately um, results in being able to successfully declare eradication. So since implementing the incident command system in March of 2018, um, we've been operating with um, primarily all redirected staff. Um, over that last year, um, we have been able to conduct rapid or full assessments on over 430, or excuse me, 480,000 acres. Um, the map that you see um, anywhere that is um, a shade of pink across this map has been identified as suitable habitat for nutria. We have been able to obtain um, now over 2,500 permits from private landowners across, um, across the area. The blue line that you see on this map is the Department of Food and Agriculture's delimitation line where they're um, currently conducting surveys around the periphery of the infestation. Within that area, um, we have set up 734 camera stations um, over natural platforms or um, our constructed platforms like you see on the, the bottom or using these artificial wooden platforms. So each of these serve as, as visual attractants and um, baited stations to um, attract nutria in to our camera stations. We have now confirmed nutria in over 140 sites, um, 40 acre cells across the landscape. And where we have confirmed nutria, we have deployed um, now 1,238 different trap sets for over 15,000 trap nights. Those resulting in um, the take or um, confirmed take of 518 nutria. 435 of those animals have come from Merced County, um, 67 from San Joaquin County, 13 from Stanislaus, two from Mariposa, one from Fresno, 
and um, we have confirmed their presence in Tuolumne County, but no animals have been taken from that county yet. So when we look at um, the spatial distribution of these animals across um, the area of infestation, you can see um, to the north, um, the majority of those animals in San Joaquin County have come from the Wallfall Slough area. Um, March 18th of this year, we confirmed um, the northernmost nutria to date there near Rough and Ready Island. Um, but generally, you can see that, that this infestation extends throughout the San Joaquin River watershed as well as the Merced River watershed um, up through Mariposa counties and over into Tuolumne. So looking ahead, um, as I mentioned, the department um, for the past year has been operating under an incident command system with redirected staff, but we have received um, tentative funding in the governor's budget, um, as well as um, now a couple of substantial grants from the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta Conservancy that will allow us to transition from an ICS of redirected staff to a formal dedicated program within the department. That funding will allow us to expand, vastly expand our field operations um, to create a team of at least 30 dedicated staff running the program and operations across the multi-county region and, and be able to effectively deal with the, um, the localized populations across that area. Some additional components um, that, are, that are in the works for this effort include the use of Judas Nutria, um, so nutria are gregarious animals. They really want to seek out and find other nutria. They are not, um, they're not looking for the perfect food plant or the most beautiful pond. All they want to find is other nutria. So um, we, for the Judas Nutria project, um, we, we trap um, nutria from the landscape. They're then sterilized and outfitted with um, satellite GPS telemetry equipment. Then they are taken and released um, for two different purposes. Um, the first being uh, releasing them in areas where we have not yet detected nutria, but suspect they may be in very low densities. So for example, that would be um, in the broader delta over through um, Grizzly Bay and Sassoon Bay, um, and a lot of the prime habitat throughout that area where detecting nutria will be very difficult. Um, the second purpose for these animals is in locations where we have infestations that we have known to occur. We have conducted knockdown trapping and mop up and we're using these animals to help us detect any remnant animals that still exist on the landscape or um, to detect any migrating animals that are coming back in. So they sort of will serve a dual purpose for us um, but really they are, um, you know, they are a, a, another tool for us to help seek out nutria on the landscape that as, as more and more of these animals are removed, it will become increasingly difficult to find in those low densities. Um, so the Judas nutria are going to be a very important tool for this project um, in the coming years. Additionally, um, we will be introducing the use of scent detection dog teams. Um, the Chesapeake Bay Nutria Eradication Project relies very heavily on the use of these dog teams, which primarily detect nutria scat, um, but also animal scent. So we're working very closely with um, Wildlife Services and the Chesapeake Bay team and the USDA's um, National Detector Dog Training Center to be able to evaluate um, use in California and any potential training adaptations that are necessary to make this the most effective tool in California. Um, I'm gonna revisit this slide one more time um, because inevitably the question comes up, why will we not implement a bounty program and why are we not encouraging hunting um, as a means for take and control? And so I, you know, I really want to stress here the similarities and overlap with our native, um, our native aquatic mammals, and that it is extremely difficult to um, distinguish between these species. So as far as the bounty program goes, um, a it, it's illegal. It's a it's against Fish and Game Code um, bounty programs. You know, it's it's unlawful. So 
you know, that should really be all the answer that is that is needed. But um, to add to that, um, we don't want to incentivize um, anything about these animals or a sustainable population here in California, um, particularly since we are not familiar with why this reintroduction occurred to begin with. Um, but also because of the impacts that we um, expect we would see on the native populations. Thank you, Sabrina. Um, so I just wanna stress here, um, another goal of this effort is to minimize impacts to, um, to non-target species and populations in this state. And to that, I wanna add um, another resource that is available um, to the public is this um, nutrient identification pocket guide that's very useful. Um, it was developed by the, the Delta Stewardship Council has been printed um, by the council as well as Department of Water Resources and is available. Um, all you need to do is contact the department and we can provide you with a supply. And lastly, I want to acknowledge um, all of the financial support that has contributed to getting this effort off the ground. None of our efforts would have been um, possible without um, redirection of, of state funding, but as well as um, substantial contributions from the Wildlife Conservation Board, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and um, particularly the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta Conservancy. And with that, I think um, first thing I want to do is point you to the URL on this page. Um, wildlife.ca.gov slash nutria is the um, incident webpage where you can find um, all this information about impacts, um, the latest information about um, detections and trapping locations and maps, um, as well as those identification flyers. And with that, I think we go to questions. Yeah, thank you, Valerie. Um, I'm gonna go ahead before people have to log off and launch our, our poll for today. Um, people wanna go ahead and start. Uh, working on that, that would be really great feedback for us. I see a couple of questions, and the first one I'm going to ask um, actually is um, from Mo Coons, um, and it's, are there any volunteer opportunities to help? Um, there are actually not any volunteer opportunities available here um, in that we are relying on um, we can't extend our authorities um, to eradicate the population to volunteers. Um, so unfortunately, it's, um, I think we would gladly take advantage of, of volunteers doing um, surveys on their own properties or in public properties, um, but in terms of, of active trapping, um, not available. Okay, and, and are you allowed to hunt for Nutria if you're a hunter? Sure, so nutria are classified as a non-game mammal, so um, they can be hunted as a rodent as long as um, hunting activities are consistent with regulations. Um, and they may also be taken by a landowner or their agent for protection of property. Um, so there are opportunities to hunt. It is just critical here that any animals that are taken be reported to the department because as I mentioned, um, we have to know where every animal comes from so that we can put every animal at risk. So um, if you see one, again, there's the identification complication, but if you can be absolutely certain that it's a nutria and you take it, please let us know. Okay, great. Um, another question here is um, a question about sort of interaction between different invasive species. What effect do nutria have on a rundo? Ooh, that's a great question. So um, in South Texas, um, nutria are present. They, um, the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department has actually reported nutria feeding exacerbating populations of Arundo down their, um, their river systems. So I mentioned they're really destructive and wasteful feeders. So they feed on, on pieces of Arundo and then they send the corms downstream and end up having population explosion um, down their river systems because of you know, these fragmentation. Um, I suspect we are experiencing similar things in California with um, populations of water hyacinth. 
So particularly in the Merced River, we have photographs of nutria out in stands of water hyacinth and parrot feather, both of which are, are fragmenting very invasive plants. Um, so again, I think those are, would be um, good foods, um, good food plants for nutria that um, they would end up sending fragments downstream and just ex exacerbating populations that are flowing to the delta. Um, Doug, did you want to ask uh, your question? <laughs> uh, sure. They were um, my questions and also on behalf of others, I guess, um, that may be curious. So two things, uh, Valerie. One is on the trapping, and um, I, assume, I assume the, uh, the nutria are being killed. Um, how is that being done with the traps and or other methods, and then do the beaver, you know, the native beavers or muskrats um, also cause any damage along the lines of what the nutria do? So as far as trapping goes, we primarily rely on live traps um, because of our, our goal of trying to minimize impacts to non-target species. And so far we, we have had success with those live traps. Um, so, yeah, once the animals are trapped, we dispatch using um, either firearms or pellet guns, um, you know, consistent with uh, humane methods. And um, as far as similarities with muskrats and beaver, there is a lot of overlap in, um, in the food plants, um, but ultimately it ends up coming down to how extensive the feeding is and that, that destructive and wasteful behavior. So, um, you know, beaver often will go for a lot of woody species. They do consume um, the um, herbaceous materials and similar plants like cattails and tules, um, just not nearly to the same extent that nutria do. And again, there's the compounding impacts of, of population size within those areas. Um, similarly, muskrats, we see some fairly, um, we see similar feeding behavior, but again, the ex it's, it's really the extent of the feeding damage um, that comes down to, to the main differences between those populations. Okay. Kind of building on, um, um, in some ways, the questions about trapping, um, Deb asked if they're fast and hard to catch. So, um, you can certainly answer that question, or if you want, describe how a live trap works a little bit more. Um, so the first thing that I'm going to note is nutria are primarily nocturnal. So there's a good chance, you know, even if they are in your area and even if they're in high densities um, or until they are in very high densities, um, it would be pretty uncommon to be able to see them. But in terms of our live traps, um, we target prime habitats, so areas where we know um, feeding is occurring. We place our cage traps in runs where we know nutria utilize um, particular pathways, um, or we use other traps like, um, like suitcase or clamshell traps that um, we end up sort of disguising the traps with um, vegetation and using baits um, such as sweet potatoes or um, the basal portions of, of cattails that are really flashy white and serve as an attractant. Um, so they come in, um, you know, step on pans and the trap closes, trap door either, either slams shut or closes doors um, and just contains them until our trappers arrive for the day to determine if it's a nutria or if it's um, another species that, that would need to be released. In terms of are they quick though, I will tell you we have seen videos of them getting away from coyotes. So <laughs> they're, they're not slow. All right. Um, and we had one more question. Oh, my chat disappeared somewhere. Um, we had one more question about um, how much trapping effort is going on in the Tuolumne and Stanislaus River. So currently we do not have trapping occurring in the Tuolumne or the Stanislaus rivers. Um, the bulk of the trapping right now is happening um, within the Delta. So near Rough and Ready Island or um, in the South Delta um, near that, that area of infestation as well as Northern Stanislaus County. Um, again, I mentioned that um, 
in the incident command, we, we've been working with redirected staff and we are still um, relatively limited um, in the extent of our operations. But once we make this transition, um, starting in July, we'll make this transition to the dedicated program where we will be able to vastly extend um, our operations and the number of staff and the locations that we can cover in the field. So um, the Tuolumne and the Stanislaus are, are um, slated to begin um, later this year and into the next year, but currently we don't have trapping occurring in those river systems. Um, we have one more question here, but I do want to note that we're, we're past time at 1250. Um, so if anyone needs to leave, feel free. Hopefully you took the poll um, before, you left, before you leave. That would be great. It really helps Doug and I know um, kind of how effective these, are, these um, webinars are and how much you like them. Um, and I do want to mention that we've got two more coming up. Um, tomorrow is... Citizen Stewardship Tackling Arundo Donax in Contra Costa County with the Walnut Creek Watershed Council folks. And then on Friday, um, we, are, we switch a little bit, but still with weeds and talk about one of the world's worst weeds and the efforts of the Marin Knotweed Action Team. So we definitely hope you'll join us for those. And I'll go ahead and ask the last question here. Or um, Valerie, now that you're not speaking, if you see the chat, you can read it too, but it, it says, um, how much effort has gone into detecting nutria in the central delta near uh, Car Carquinas Straits to eastern Contra Costa County? Um, so the department has not done a ton of work in Contra Costa County yet. Um, we have some surveys along the county line, um, along the eastern edge of the county. Are you guys able to hear me okay? I'm getting a strange message on my computer. Um, um, however, yeah, it's, it's breaking up a little bit, but we can still hear you. Okay. Um, so, but I did mention the Department of Food and Agriculture is working on delimitation surveys um, around the periphery of where we are working. So the Department of Food and Agriculture um, has an extensive line of camera stations um, through Contra Costa County right now um, and has established permanent monitoring stations um, further out into the Delta beyond um, our nearest detections, which are currently at Rough and Ready Island. So um, in terms of Contra Costa County, um, the Department of Food and Agriculture is most active in that area yet so far. All right. Um, it looks like that's all the questions that we had in the chat, and we're getting close to one o'clock. Doug, do you have any additional comments? Nope. Nope. Just thank you uh, to everybody for joining us. Really appreciate it, and thank you, Valerie, for taking time out of your busy day to share uh, some of this interesting story going on in California right now. Oh, wait. There's one last question. Has anyone eaten one? And... Um, I'll, I'll leave that to you, Valerie. I think I've tried it. I was at a conference in Louisiana last year where we spent a lot of time talking about their efforts and they definitely have um, talked to different chefs about um, cooking them as well as the fur industry about using them for clothing. Yeah, they've, they've really done a lot of work in Louisiana trying to promote their consumption just as another reason to, to try to promote take there. Um, we have tried them here, um, you know, not, not terrible, not something I'm going to crave, um, but, you know, I suppose, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that, not terrible. <laughs> it, it, was, it was better with a lot of cayenne spice, your Cajun spice, so. <laughs> All right, well, thank you everyone, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, appreciate you all joining us.